Well, as you see from the slide on the screen now, this is the first of a series of talks about the steps to salvation. And uh, this depends on uh, the four steps, the first one being belief. Um, if someone doesn't believe, then of course uh, it, they will never have any reason to take any further action, any more steps along that pathway. The second one is repentance. And that's a change in one's belief and behavior. It's a redirection of one's life based on the conviction that Christianity is true. The third of these steps is baptism, which is an outward expression of this internal change in one's mind. That is the conviction that Christianity is true. And we'll consider this briefly later in this presentation because it does relate also to belief. And then the final stage, living in Christ, of course, is, means following the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ, as in, indicated in the New Testament, living a life in accordance with the uh, beliefs that one has then acquired. Now, there's a famous stay, saying, isn't there, that um, every journey begins with the first step. Now, it's rather important in this context, because the first step, belief, is probably the most crucial. If someone has a conviction that Christianity, the faith of, of, of Jesus Christ is correct, and then they'll want to take the other steps. But if they're not convinced, then there'll be no um, inclination to uh, step any further. So this journey begins with belief. Now, I suppose it's fair to say that most people, quite reasonably, would require some evidence on which to base their belief in Christianity. I find it rather strange that many people don't actually investigate what Christianity claims, they just dismiss it out of hand. Uh, it, it's a bit like saying, um, I, I've never tried lemonade because I don't like it. How do you know you don't like it if you haven't tried it? Now this is, uh, that's rather a trite example, but it's true, isn't it? How can you dismiss something that you've not really investigated and given a fair hearing. And of course, I have some sympathy in the present world because, uh, let's be frank about it, the behavior of some church leaders and, uh, and others is no commendation to the Christian faith. But it's often been said, you must never judge a book by its cover. You have to read it to find out whether uh, it's acceptable or not. So I began to think, what sort of evidence might uh, convince you that Christianity is true? Well, I came across a, a book some while ago. I have a copy here. It's by a famous atheist, Anthony Flew, who was the doyen, as they said, of, of, of uh, atheism. Everyone looked to him as a leader. Uh, he was totally convinced there was no God. He was a total atheist. And then he changed his mind, and that's why the book cover has the word no crossed out and an A put on. He used to say there is no God, now he says there is a God. Or he, he, I, think, I think he died a little while ago, but towards the end of his life, he was convinced that there was a God, uh, and therefore you, you could no longer be an atheist if that was true. And so he changed his mind because of the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that's what I'm going to concentrate on from this point, because I think if, if a, a famous atheist, very much looked up to by other atheists, suddenly changes his mind, and the reason he's changed his mind is he's reviewed the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus, then I think that's a fairly sound place where we can start. So if the evidence uh, of the resurrection was sufficient to convince someone who was the doyen of the uh, atheists, perhaps it will, will convince you too. Now, I think it's fair to say that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is really the fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Without it, Christianity doesn't make any sense. I want to say that it's not just uh, given in the Gospels. The, the, the account, of course, is given in, in the four Gospels, but that's not the only place, and I think that's rather important. For example, the Jewish historian Josephus describes it in his book, The Antiquity of the Jews, written about 93 AD. Not all that long, 40 years or so after the resurrection of Jesus. 
and he treats it uh, as a fact. Now, I have to be honest here. We'll just look at the passage I have in mind. Critics don't accept it. Some people say, oh, it was tinkered with and added later. Well, they would, wouldn't they, if they don't accept it? Because if we have an independent evidence of someone who, who lived around that time and was writing about his own people and their history, and he comes up with a statement like this, um, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, uh, I'm, I've missed out the unimportant words, a wise man, and when Pilate, that is the Roman governor at the time, had condemned him to the cross, that is to be crucified, he appeared alive again the third day, which is exactly what the New Testament tells us. So we have an independent uh, witness, but I want to concentrate now, if I may, on the uh, biblical evidence. When Paul wrote his letter to the um, Christians in uh, Rome, he said uh, that he, he was writing to them as a servant of Christ Jesus. He was an apostle. He served God. And he speaks of the apostle he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In other words, this was set out in the Old Testament. And he continues, regarding his son, the Lord Jesus, who, as to his human nature, was a descendant of David. And that's given, the details are given in the New Testament. And who, through the spirit of holiness, that's God's Holy Spirit, was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's the important thing. The key proof, says Paul, as to the true nature of the Lord Jesus was that he rose from the dead and that pointed him out as the Son of God. And he sets out in, in another letter the importance of the resurrection of Jesus in a letter to uh, the Corinthians, which a chapter of which we read together with our chairman uh, this afternoon. And he demonstrates the importance uh, of it in seven key facts. And I want to go through this, so I'll take you now, I'll put it up on the screen. We're going to look at the 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12 onwards. And Paul says, if it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then the first point of those seven is, not even Christ has been raised. In other words, if there's no such thing as resurrection, then claims that Jesus rose from the dead must be false. He goes on to say, if Christ has not been raised, he and the other apostles point to our preaching is useless. You know, that's quite a profound thing. When you think of what Paul and the other apostles went through in their travelings, in their sufferings of, to promulgate the gospel throughout the Roman world, it would be a very powerful blow to find that what they've been preaching was a waste of time and therefore it was useless, he says. Uh, more than that, he says... Oh, I'm sorry, go back one. More than that, he says, um, we're, your, your faith is faced, a waste of time as well. And then he goes on, uh, if Christ hasn't been raised, as he says, your uh, faith is, is uh, useless... And, of course, uh, their preaching is useless. The whole thing is, is a waste of time, and all that suffering means nothing. And then he goes on, if Christ has not been raised, more than that, we are found false witnesses of God. That's the fourth point. Now, that's very serious, isn't it? What Paul says is, if we've been going around talking about the resurrection of Jesus, and it's not true, we're liars. And worst of all, we're liars about God, and that's a very serious thing to do. Because we've testified that God raised Christ from the dead. And then he goes on, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. That's point five. In other words, the whole point of Jesus' death, his sacrificial death on the cross, was a waste of time, because he wasn't raised and therefore they were still in their sins. And the whole point of his suffering and death then is lost. Uh, and then his uh, sixth point, those who uh, are uh, fallen asleep in Christ, which is a, a New Testament statement really about death. You see, Christians believe they'll be raised again, as uh, we Christadelphians believe. Uh, 
Uh, and so they didn't say they died, they said they'd fallen asleep. It was a dreamless sleep. And one day when Jesus returns and the dead are resurrected, they'll wake again. And then the final point, number seven, which I think uh, must have been said with great feeling or written with great feeling. If only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Because the sufferings of the apostles and their final execution in many cases, Peter and, and Paul uh, apparently were executed for their faith and many of those probably were as well. It does seem rather sad that they've gone through all this suffering and, and problems and difficulties and finally died for the faith. No wonder they were to be pitied more than all men. So we see, don't we, on those passages alone, how much hinges on the reality of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you might say we need a little bit more than just quotations from the Bible, and that's reasonable. So let's see if we can find some evidence that confirms it and see where it leads us. We'll look at the evidence and see where we get. Well, I think the first thing we can reasonably say is whatever else, the resurrection uh, is difficult to explain away, but one key factor keeps coming up and that is on the third day after Jesus was buried in a tomb the body was missing I don't think anybody has ever disputed that I may be wrong but I've never found anyone who disputed that the body was put in a tomb and if you went to the tomb on the third day the body wasn't there now perhaps we could just push that a little further and say it was unnaturally missing you see the women in the New Testament who were going to uh, anoint the body of Jesus went to the tomb expecting to find it there but it wasn't there and when they told the disciples that the tomb was empty and the body was missing they too were amazed so I think we could say well there's something to be answered here isn't it if the body had been there and it finally decayed as all bodies do when they're placed in a grave then that would be the end of Christianity but it didn't end there did it it flourished to become one of the major religions of the Roman Empire now today critics especially critics of the Bible try to explain away the resurrection they've come up with some suggested alternative explanations other than Jesus rose from the dead and they come under about three main headings the first one is that the disciples removed the body from the tomb. They stole the body and it gave the impression of a resurrection. The third is that Jesus didn't actually die. He uh, appeared to be dead but later revived and so it wasn't really a resurrection. And the third one is that when the women went to anoint the body they got the wrong tomb. It was a tomb that was already empty, as it were. They, they got the wrong place. The, te the, the tomb that they wanted to find a body, it wasn't there. And they immediately jumped to the conclusion Jesus had been raised from the dead. Well, let's have a look at these in turn, shall we? The first one is that the disciples stole the body. And Matthew tells us that when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan... They gave the soldiers who'd been guarding the tomb a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Well, putting that around as a story uh, would get them out of this difficult situation that it appeared that the body had been resurrected. But it put the Roman soldiers in some difficulty because it was tantamount to admitting dereliction of duty. Under normal circumstances, they would, be suffered, they would suffer quite severely for, for, for doing this. In fact, they would be put to death. And they would be put to death by their fellow Roman soldiers because the tradition was in the Roman army that if a, a soldier let his colleagues down, they executed him for his own good. I know that may sound too odd to us, but if he let them down, if he failed in his duty he would be shunned by everybody no one would talk to him no one would sell things to him he would just be a total outcast from society he would be in total disgrace and it was kinder for his colleagues to either stone him or club him to death put him out of his misery might say 
So it was very serious, and these Roman soldiers who were being asked to go around saying, oh yes, they stole the body while we're all fast asleep, would put them in some difficulty. And of course they realised that Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, would be uh, concerned that they were executed. And so they said, if this report gets to the governor, the Pilate, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day, says Matthew. Now, I think this explanation shows how desperate the authorities were in trying to suppress the suggestion that Jesus had been resurrected. I want you to imagine if Pilate decided he'd put them on trial. Let's just use our imaginations, and they're in court, and the prosecuting counsel says uh, something like this um, Julius Septimus um, you were the uh, centurion in charge weren't you uh, while the, the soldiers were guarding the tomb uh, yes that's right sir and you say that while all of you were asleep at night the disciples came along and removed the body to give the impression there had been a resurrection oh yes that's right sir if you are all fast asleep how could you possibly know who had come and stolen the body, or had stolen the body. It's preposterous, isn't it? I mean, if they were fast asleep, how could they know what happened? But nobody seems to have looked at that at the time. They just wanted the story suppressed. And so, uh, even more ironical, there were rumours that that might happen. The rumours came about because Jesus had said on the third day he would rise again. And no doubt, whenever he said this, people listened. And they maybe expected it to happen, because everything else that Jesus said had proved true. So they took steps to prevent that. And the day after he'd been put in the tomb, the Pharisee, it was a preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So, give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. So they got into great trouble to make sure the body wasn't stolen by having a Roman guard uh, looking after it. And then they said the Roman guard fell asleep and that's what happened the body was, was able to be removed. See, again, ironically, the disciples themselves didn't expect Jesus to, to rise. They were in d depths of dis despondency after he'd been put to death. But funnily enough, the religious authorities had registered what Jesus had said. And just to be sure, Pilate, um, he, he was no fool. He thought, right, we'll put a Roman guard to prevent any attempt to steal the body. And so he, he says to them, take a guard, Go and make the tomb as secure as you know. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. So here we have the very precautions taken to prevent the di disciples stealing the body. But when the body went missing, the explanation was the disciples stole the body. It's really quite ironical, isn't it? But you see, there's more to it than that. Why would they steal the body? What are they going to do with it if they could steal it? How were they supposed to steal it from a sealed tomb guarded by Romans? It just doesn't make sense. What would they do with it when they had stolen it? Would they bury it somewhere else? I mean, it's pointless. He's already in the tomb of a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, the best tomb money could provide at the time. And why would they want to perpetrate a fraud? I mean, they were so despondent at his death. Why, why would they want to pretend it had never happened and, and he'd been raised from the dead? It seems very unlikely given, uh, unlikely, given the fact that the disciples just didn't believe that Jesus would rise again, in spite of his telling them time and time again. And it's hard to believe, isn't it, that they and the disciples and, and the early Christians would suffer so dreadfully uh, being persecuted for their faith if they knew it was all a fraud and Jesus had not risen from the dead. Now, the second explanation <clears throat> of the missing body was that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. Uh, and critics have suggested that uh, he merely swooned uh, 
and later he revived in the cool of the tomb. Well, we have to be honest about this. There have been cases where someone appears to have died, uh, a doctor assures the uh, family or, or whoever's nearby that uh, he's done all the tests, there's no sign of life and that person is dead and he's prepared to sign a certificate. The body is then removed to the mortuary and some time later, unfortunately, to the horror of perhaps someone working there, especially someone new working in the mortuary, uh, they're busy sort of cleaning the body and suddenly it sits, sits up and says something. You know, it must be a terrible shock. Now, it's not unknown for people to be in a deep coma, apparently dead, and they, they then, uh, as it were, come back to life. They've never really been dead, but they, they now have all the signs of life. It comes as a shock, but also as a relief to their loved ones and, and dear ones. Now, it's fair to say this... Sorry. It may seem a, a reasonable solution, but actually this so-called explanation can raise more problems than actually solved. And we, we'll be able to find that by looking at John's Gospel, where it's explained that it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath of the Passover. Because the Jews didn't want the bodies of the, for the Lord Jesus and the other criminals who were uh, um, crucified with him. They didn't want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have their legs broken and the bodies taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and then of the other, but not of the Lord Jesus. Now the technique of breaking legs, it sounds rather uh, dreadful, but there were two reasons for this. Firstly, the victims of crucifixion found it difficult to breathe in that position and it got worse and worse as, as, as the, you know, the, the execution continued and so they had to push up with their feet to breathe and of course they got nails in their ankles so that was really painful if they broke the legs of the victims then they couldn't do that and so they died reasonably quickly of asphyxiation so that's one reason why they did just put them out of the misery eventually I mean it was very painful to have your legs broken but you died within a reasonable time secondly the bodies were never given a decent burial. The normal thing was to take the bodies from the cross and just throw them in the local uh, uh, rubbish dump. This, this was a t dreadful way of t treating people. For the Jews and most ancient peoples, a decent burial was essential. But they were just thrown in with the rubbish. Now, just suppose they weren't actually dead at that stage and still had some life in them. What if they tried to get out of the rubbish dump? Well, it'd be very difficult if your legs were broken. You might be able to crawl pulling yourself on your hands, but it, you know, it just wouldn't work with it. And so that's uh, why they did it. But in the case of the Lord Jesus, they did break his legs. They took even more precautions. The Romans were experienced by crucifixion. They knew what they were doing. If they put somebody to death by crucifixion, they made sure they died. When they came to Jesus, they examined him and found he was already dead. But just to make sure, one of them took a spear and thrust it in his side so that it pierced his lungs and his heart. They made sure he was dead. They were convinced he was dead, but they made sure. And so uh, uh, John, John says that um, when they came to Jesus, he, they found he was already dead. They didn't break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Okay, let's just for a moment suppose that People were wrong in assuming that Jesus was dead and that he actually was still just about alive. And when he was put into this tomb, which was sealed, no doubt with a cement, he revived, in that lovely phrase, in the cool of the tomb. If he did, how did he get out? You know, it's an interesting question because most of the tombs, and in this case we know for certain from the description, had a stone, a circular stone, which was rolled down a slope over the entrance. How could you move that stone from the inside? You see, it was wider than the entrance, so only a small part of it was visible inside the tomb. How could you get a purchase on it? I mean, it's true that if you were trying to open it from the outside, you'd have to break the cement seal, and then you'd have to really put some pressure on the stone to move it. But if we're in the inside, you can't break the seal, 
And the only way you can try to move it is to put your hands flat against the stone. Now, I understand that some rock climbers have this uh, knack when they're in a difficult situation of wetting their hands and almost using it like a sucker on the rock to get, get over a, a, an obstacle. But if Jesus did that on the inside of the tomb against the stone, he wouldn't be able to give enough force to open it. So if he wasn't dead when he was buried, he soon would be, because he wouldn't be able to get out of the tomb, and eventually, of course, he'd use up the oxygen because it was sealed, and that would be a certain death as well. But let's just assume that he did get out. How did he continue to live without being detected? He'd have to go on, wouldn't he, for, for a long time, living in hiding, perhaps, to give the impression he'd risen from the dead. And then he would die again, wouldn't he? So, eventually, they'd have a dead body. See, it doesn't make sense, does it? It, it, it sounds convincing, but when you look into it, it isn't. Now, the third explanation the very simple and apparently quite ingenious one concerns the arrival of uh, Mary Magdalene at the tomb when she was distraught to find it empty. And the record says, uh, oh sorry, the record says that the angels there asked the question, woman, why are you crying? They've taken away my Lord, she said. I don't know where they've put him. Ah, said the critics. That's the explanation. I mean, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognise him, says John. But the critic sees on that phrase, I don't know where they've put him. And so um, it, it seems as though what they're really doing um, is moving in on that. Now, John continues, and I just want to include this. Um, the Lord Jesus asks her the same question, because he's now there, raised, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, because no doubt her eyes were full of tears and she just see the outside of someone, and she didn't expect Jesus to be there. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. That, that's a cry, isn't it, from a desperate woman who's been separated from her Lord. But the critics seize on this phrase, I don't know where they have put him. And so they say, ah, this passage gives the clear impression that Mary and perhaps the other women had gone to the wrong tomb and finding it empty concluded that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Now I could expect that sort of thing to happen, say in a military cemetery, where all the gravestones, the headstones are all alike, and you're trying to find the one that Uncle Bill is buried under. You'd have to walk up and down and try and read them, and you might get confused and, and may even go to the wrong part of the cemetery because they're all the same. But this won't occur here, was it? Would it? Because it's quite simple. If they've gone to the wrong tomb, we have to explain a number of things. First is that the record says uh, the women who'd come with Jesus um, saw how his body was laid in the tomb. It was in a private garden of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, as John 19 tells us, it wasn't a public cemetery. It was someone's private garden. It was the only tomb in the garden. You couldn't miss it. So they couldn't possibly have gone to the wrong tomb. They'd seen where the body had been put, uh, and they went back to the same place later to add uh, uh, um, the, the anointing of the body that they wanted to, to uh, do for the Lord as their last uh, act of kindness. So we have another question to ask. If they'd gone to the wrong tomb and the body was in the right tomb, why did the authorities have to invent the explanation that the body had been stolen by the disciples? They could just say, it's in this other tomb. Look, it's still here. So they had to make up a story. Oh, they came and stole it while we're fast asleep. You have to say that, you soldiers. It doesn't make sense, does it? We really have to ask the question then, why did the authorities not exhume the body of Jesus from the other tomb and produce it in evidence? The body would be in good condition. It had been enclosed in 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes to retard decay. It would be quite recognisable by day three. You see, it doesn't hang true, does it? We've come full circle. Whatever you say to try and explain it away, it just does not fit. All attempts to explain away the resurrection of Jesus have produced 
no real proper explanation. Some time ago, uh, Frank Morrison set out to prove that the resurrection had never happened, and he was going to write a book to show that. Now, he was a lawyer, and he'd be very good at sifting evidence, I'm sure, and he'd be well equipped to consider the evidence for the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. He started out to write a book saying it never happened, and he ended up with a book claiming that it did. Now, that, again, is wonderful evidence, I think, that the evidence of the resurrection will stand scrutiny. Now, there's another important thing, and this is a, a lovely link to the next uh, talk in this series, because there's a very strong link between the resurrection and the belief in resurrection by Christians and the initiation into the faith of Christians, which is by baptism. Because there's a, a, a link between the two, and that link is that baptism itself is a symbolic death and resurrection. So those who are convinced as Christians that Jesus rose from the dead declare that by saying, yes, I want to follow him in a, in a symbolic death and resurrection through the waters of baptism. Uh, coming back to Paul again. He said, don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism, buried in the water symbolically, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we, may, uh, we too may live a new life. And that symbolism is important because he says, if we have been united with him like this in his death, we'll certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. And he goes on, for we know that our old self was crucified with him. Again, that lovely link. In other words, it, it, the old self was put to death, a, a repentance, which will be uh, a third talk. Uh, and, and the body of sin is done away with. So we're no longer slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And if we've been symbolically in death and resurrection by baptism, if we died in that way with Christ, he says, we believe that we'll also live with him. And he continues, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died it in sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, repentance, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So I hope by now we've come to the conclusion that the evidence for the resurrection of Christ is substantial, can be believed, and the first step on the way to salvation is covered. Belief in Christ is assured by his baptism. Music